before we go into the idea of competence and torics, a bit about factorial notation. Okay, the actual definition of factorial notation. Naught factorial is defined as 1. Okay? But then from other integers going up, it's simply n factorial then is n times n minus 1 factorial. So it sort of builds up. That's the formal definition of a factorial. So from that we can conclude, well, 1 factorial then must be 1 times 0 factorial. But we've defined 0 factorial to be 1, so 1 times 1 is 1. And then 2 factorial, by definition, is 2 times 1 factorial. So it's 2 times 1, which is 2. 3 factorial then is 3 times 2 factorial, so it's 3 times 2, which is 6. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 factorial, so it's 4 times 6, which is 24. Say so formally, that's how we do factorial. Reality, uh, we just go, if it was 5 factorial, we go oh, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. But formally, 5 factorial would have been 5 times 4 factorial. So n factorial then is n times n minus 1 factorial. But then n minus 1 factorial was n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 factorial. And you keep going and you get what you're used to seeing for factorial. n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. And you work your way down to, to 1. So you get a question like this. And let's pretend our calculators are broken. But sometimes it's quicker to do it without calculators anyway. 12 factorial on 9 factorial, I can rewrite as 12 times 11 factorial on 9 factorial. Remember the definition, 12 factorial is 12 times 11 factorial. But then the 11 factorial I could write as 11 times 10 factorial. And the 10 factorial I could write as 10 times 9 factorial. But now I've got 9 factorial on top and bottom. It's simply 12 times 11 times 10. Now, I'm not saying you would write those steps in every single time. The, the key is, though, that the, the lower factorial will always cancel into the bigger factorial, leaving you with the multiplication of the numbers above it. So this one is just 12 times 11 times 10, 1,320. So I get something like 16 factorial on 10 factorial times 7 factorial. Then I'm going to choose the bigger one to cancel. So I'll cancel the 10 factorial into the 16 factorial. And now it's 16 times 15 times 14 times 13 times 12 times 11 over. And the 7 factorial is still on the bottom. So we get 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 2 times 1. And then we just look for cancelling. Well, I know 7 times 2 is 14, so that'll cancel. So I now have 16 times 15 times 13 times 12 times 11 on 6 times 5 times 4 times 3. Well, hang on, 5 times 3 is 15. I know that'll cancel. So I now have 16 times 13 times 12 times 11 on 6 times 4. Well, 6 goes into 12 two times. And 4 goes into 16 4 times. So I'm left with 4 times 13 times 2 times 11, which is 4 times 26 times 11, which is 104 times 11, which is 1,144. Yes, that's how we used to do it with our calculators. We just break down all those factors and what have you. Fortunately, you have calculators and get, you can do it a lot quicker. But it's still important to know about that factorising because if we get examples where we're not using numbers, we might have x factorial or something. We need to know how that cancelling works. Like this. So if you have 1 on k factorial plus 1 on k minus 2 factorial, that calculator is not going to help you. So I rewrite, it. I need a common denominator. That common denominator will be k factorial because k factorial would be the bigger multiplication. But I've rewritten k factorial as k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 factorial just to highlight how I've changed the denominator. So it becomes k on k minus 1 plus 1, isn't it? And then we get k squared minus k plus 1 on k factorial. There's our, our answer. So that's just a bit about factorials, which we, will come in handy during our work. But here comes the bit we're more interested in. You see, when we're dealing with those two-unit factorial, factorials, those two-unit probability type questions, the key was finding the sample space. And that's okay. I mean, that method works. But it's really time-wasting. Because a lot of those events in the sample space, you're not actually interested in. You're just interested in how many are there? 
I don't, I don't need to know the ones I'm not interested in. And so now we come to an idea, well, can we work out how many without physically working out what each possibility is? So that brings us to the basic counting principle. So if you have an event, it can happen in m different ways, and then after that you have another event that can happen in n different ways, then the number of ways the two events can happen is m times n. Because if you think about drawing a tree diagram, you would branch off m, and then off each of those you'd branch off n, you'd end up with m times n branches. So three dice are rolled. How many ways could those three dice fall? You'd say, well, hang on. The first dice, roll it, oh, there's six different things that could happen. The second dice, oh yeah, six different things that could happen. The third one, oh yeah, there's six different things that could happen. So all up, there's 216 things that could happen. I don't want to draw that sample space up. 216 events, it's just going to take too long. So the number of ways of arranging n distinct objects with replacement, so this is important because it's with replacement we're talking about here. Once I roll a six, it doesn't mean I can't roll a six again. Okay. In k different ways, it would simply be n to the power of k. So in this one, I could have said six cubed rather than six times six times six. Okay, so how many ways can all three dice show the same number? Well, that would be six times one times one. I roll the first dice, six possibilities. But now I want them all to show the same number. Second one's only got one possibility. Third one's only got one possibility. So there's only six. And again, logic would tell you that's true, because either they all show a one, or they all show a two, or they all show a three. And so yeah, it was six. Which then brings up the classic probability question. Well, what's the probability that all three dice show the same number? So I don't have to draw up the whole sample space because I know, well, it's the number of ways the particular event I'm looking for happens, which we just said was six, over the total size of the sample space, which we worked out was 216. So we know it's one in 36. I don't have to create this huge sample space. Here's one from an HSC. Mice are placed in a maze and there are five exits. Each mouse is equally likely to leave the maze through any of the exits. The probability, therefore, of any mouse leaving a particular exit is one in five. It's a one in five choice that one. Four mice, which we'll call A, B, C, and D, are put in the maze. They behave independently. So what one mice does, one mice, what one mouse does, doesn't affect what the other mice do. What's the probability that A, B, C, and D all go out the same exit? Okay. Total number of possibilities. Well, everything was equally likely. It's with replacement. So the total number of possibilities would be 5 to the power of 4. So 625 possibilities. Okay. Another way of thinking about that is mouse A, 5 choices. Mouse B, 5 choices. Mouse C, 5 choices. Mouse D, 5 choices. So 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. So 5 to the power of 4. Now we're interested in they all go through the same door. Well, that would be five times one times one times one using the counting principle, right? Because the first mouse, so whoever's gonna go out first, they got five doors they can go through. But we want them all to go through the same door. So then the second mouse and the third mouse and the fourth mouse all have one choice. They've gotta go through the same door. So now we can combine the two uh, things and go, well, probability they all use the same exit then must be five out of the 625 different ways these mice could leave the maze, which simplifies down to be one in 125. Okay. Part two of that question. What's the probability that A, B, and C go out the same door, but D goes out a different door? Okay. A, B, and C use the same exit. D uses a different exit. So the number of ways that could happen. I'm going to let D go out first. So D goes out first. Got five to choose from. Now, the next mouse, whether that be A, B, or C, doesn't matter. Well, can't go out that same door. We want them to go through a different door. Four choices. Well, that means the remaining two mice, I, I want to go through the same door as the second mouse. So I've only got one choice. 
So there are 20 different ways this could happen, that A, B and C use the same exit, but D uses a different exit. So putting that all together then, we get 20 out of 600, the total 625 possibilities. So that's a 4 in 125. So then they came up with this one. What then is the probability that any three of the four mice go out the same exit and the other one goes out a different exit? Remember, we just worked out that D goes through the different exit. Well, that's how it could be any of them. So, all right, we know, we just worked out D uses a different exit. But everything's equally likely in this question. So the probability that A uses a different exit would also be 4 in 125. Probability that B uses a different exit would be 4 in 125. Probability that C uses a different exit would be 4 in 125. So therefore, the probability that any of them might use a different exit to the other three would be 4 times 4 in 125. So that's 16 in 125. All right, now what they're asking us. What is the probability that no more than two of the mice go out the same exit? No more than two of the mice go out the same exit. I'm going to use the complementary idea on this one because I can use things we've already worked out. If you think of the complementary event, well, if no more than two, well, then the complementary event must be more than two years the same, which is three years the same, which we've worked out, and they all use the same, which we've worked out. So I'll just go one minus what we worked out for all of them go through the same exit, which is one in 125, and then minus three is the same exit, which we worked out was 16 on 125, giving us 108 and 125. So that was the basic counting principle. And that was with replacement, a lot of that. We're now going to look at this idea of permutations. Now, a permutation is an ordered set of objects. So the order that things happen is important. So in other words, it's an arrangement. Case one, we're going to order a set of n different things from a set of n objects. In other words, I'm going to use all the objects. So we want to arrange n different objects, and we often think of it, oh, well, we'll just line them up. How could we do that? I'll go back to the basic counting principle. Over in the corner, there's my n different objects. I'm going to grab one. I've got n choices. So there's n different objects I could go right out, you're going to go first. Now I'm going to go get the second object. Well, there's n minus 1 left. I'm going to put that in the line. Now I'm going to go get the next object. Well, there's n minus 2. And I'm going to keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going, until eventually there's only one object left. I say, right out, you're going last. So it turns out to be something we've seen already. n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. It's simply n factorial. So if you're going to use every single object and line them up, it's just n factorial. So here's a question then. Five boys, four girls, we're going to arrange them out the front of the room. No restrictions. How many ways could I do that? Well, it's simply nine factorial. You see, if there's no restrictions, the fact that I said there was five boys and four girls is irrelevant. This is nine people that I'm lining up. So I've got nine objects, nine factorial ways of doing it. So, whoa, 362,880. Don't worry, we're not going to try it. But here's where you see the power of this idea. Imagine having to come up with that sample space so you could go and answer a probability question. I mean, it's just unrealistic. Well, what about if we want to make a nice pattern? We'll make the boys and girls alternate in our line. How many ways could we do that? Always look after the, any restriction first. If I have to line up the boys and the girls so they alternate, there's one key restriction I have to take into account here. I've got five boys and four girls. What is my restriction? What must happen? Okay, you want to alternate. The restriction is about the first object. The first object must be a boy. Because if I start with a girl, I'm not going to be able to alternate because I'm going to run out of girls. I'll be left with two boys. So that's no good. 
So the first person must be a boy. So in other words, there's only one possibility that can go first, has to be a boy. Now I'm going to arrange the boys, just the boys. There's five of them, five factorial ways of doing it. Now I'm going to arrange the girls. There's four factorial. And that's all I need to do, because once I've arranged the girls, I can say, look, just slot in between the boys. So you've got your alternating pattern. Had there been the same number, say there was five boys and five girls, then instead of one at the start, I'd have two at the start, because I have a choice to make. Will I start with a boy, or will I start with a girl? So I've got to look after that condition first. What am I going to start with? So I would have said two times. And in that case, it would have been 5 factorial, 5 factorial, because I've got the same number. 2,880. Which then leads us to the probability question, the logical probability question that comes next. What's the probability that the boys and girls alternate? Well, we just worked out 2,880 out of the 362,880. That all tidies down to be a 1 in 126 chance that if we just group of girls and boys, five boys, four girls, wasn't it? Go line yourselves up. That's the chance that they end up alternating. Okay. All right, let's, let's put a different restriction on it. What happens if two of the girls want to be together? They're great mates. No, nah, we've got to be together. Fair enough. Look after the restriction first. So the first thing I'm going to do is work out which order those two girls want to stand in. So, well, the two of you want to be together. You just work out your order. Two objects, two factorial. Now, once they've worked out their order, this is how I'm going to stand, we think of them as one person. Once they've worked out their order, that's it. They're locked together, like they're one object now. So that now means I'm going to arrange eight objects. Those two girls that are locked together are considered as one object, and I've got seven other people. So all up, eight objects to arrange. So two factorial times eight factorial gives me 80,640 ways of doing that. That's if I use everything. What happens if I don't use everything? So that's what this one's saying. I'm going to arrange k objects from a set of n. k is less than n, so I'm not going to use all of them. I'm going to use some of the objects. How does this differ? So, same idea, I've got n objects over there in the corner. I only want to arrange k of them. Starts off the same. I'm going to go grab the first object, n. There you go. I'll go grab the next object, n minus 1. There you go. Then n minus 2. Okay. Then I'm going to get to a point where I've got the kth object. So how many ways can I arrange the kth object? Well, let's have a look at the pattern. The first object, it was n minus 0, if you like. So it was just n. The second object was n minus 1. The third object was n minus 2. So it makes sense that the kth object would be n minus k, but plus 1, to keep that pattern going. There's a better way of thinking of that. Because now I can play with factorials. It's like I've cancelled... Okay, so like we did with those fractions before, I've cancelled the k factorial with a k factorial on the bottom. Okay? Because after that n minus k plus 1 would have come n minus k, then n minus k minus 1, then n minus k minus 1, until we got down to the 1. So I could simply write it that way. n factorial on n minus k factorial. And what that actually means is this. Had I used all the objects, we know there's n factorial ways I could have done it. But I'm leaving a group over here. There's n minus k objects that I'm not using. So I'm going to divide by the number of ways I could have arranged those people. Because I'm not interested in them. I'm not going to use them. So I divide it out. So the number of ways I, I can arrange the objects that I'm not going to use. That's what that's basically saying. n factorial divided by the objects I'm not going to use. On your calculator, you have a lovely button that works that out for you. Uh, it's uh, On a lot of them, it's on the, I think, permutations on the multiplication key. I think you've got a shift or mode um, with the multiplication key. And it'll work it out for you. 
It's still important we know where it comes from, of course, just in case we get one that's dealing with algebra rather than numbers, but obviously that will save us a bit of time. So, okay, we love doing these word problems in maths where well, we don't care about words being real. So the word is problems. See, we're looking at a problem. The word is problems. We're only going to make five letter words though. So we're not going to use all the letters. How many words could I make? No restrictions. I'm just going to use all those letters. Well, all five of them anyway, that I end up choosing. So that would be 8P5. There's eight letters all up. I'm only going to use five of them. P for permutation, because the order is going to be important in this case, because how I arrange them will make different words. If you punch the button on your calculator, you'll get 6,720. If you did it using factorials, it would be 8 factorial divided by 3 factorial, because there's three letters I'm not going to use. So divide it by the three letters I'm not going to use. Okay. But let's make the problem more fun. Let's put a restriction in it. We're saying, I'm only interested in words that begin with P for some insane reason. Okay, look after the restriction first. The restriction is P has to go first. How many ways can I now get this P? Well, it can only be arranged one way. It has to be first. So, bang, we put P first. I'm going to then times it by 7P4 because the question has now changed. I've put the P, which now means I'm saying, well, how many ways can I arrange four letters of problems? Now the P's gone. I've used it. So four out of problems. Well, that's 7P4. Ends up being 840. Let's do even better than that. So this time, P's included, but this time it's not going to be the first letter. M, no, we don't like M. We're not going to use M at all. Look after the restriction. I'm going to place P. There's only four spots I can put P this time because it can't go first. So four. It's now times six P4. M's excluded. Like M does not exist. So instead of problems, it's now robbles. And I'm going to create four letter words from robbles. 1,440. Let's try another one. Six people are in a boat. The boat's got eight seats. Four, spelled incorrectly, on each side. What's the probability that Bill and Ted are on the left side and Greg's on the right? Okay. Um, it's a probability question. So the first thing I want to do is work out the size of the sample space, because that'll go on the bottom of the fraction. So that's going to be 8p6. The order is important. So 8p6. There's eight seats in the boat. I'm going to use six of them. So 20,160 objects in our sample space. That'll go on the bottom of the fraction. Now let's work out the probability or the number of ways we can do what we're interested in. First restriction. So I've got these six people, but Bill and Ted have said, we have to go on the left. All right, go and find yourself your seats. It's 4P2, because they've only got four seats to choose from. So 4P2. And that's when Greg comes up and says, well, hang on a sec. If they're going to go on the left, I want to go on the right. Okay, you go sit down. Four seats to choose from. 4P1. The rest of them go... <laughs> we don't know what those three were on about. We don't care where we sit. So how many seats are left? We've used up three. So there's five seats left, and they're going to get three of them. So 5P3. 2,880. We can now work out the probability. So 2,880 over 20,160, which simply simplifies, simply simplifies, down to a one in seven chance that that happens. Okay. So... I hope that you see the power of this idea, the basic counting principle and permutations. Not having to draw up the huge sample space, we can work out much more interesting uh, problems. Let's look at another HSC one. Five blocks. There's a red one, a blue one, a green one, a yellow one, and a white one. And we're going to create towers. 
of two, three, four, and five. You see, a block of one is not a tower. It's just a block. So towers don't start until we've got two of them. How many different towers can be formed that are three blocks high? And we're going to look at these towers. So the colors are important. Okay. Well, it'll be 5p3. There's five blocks I could use. Basically, I'm just arranging three of them to create a, a tower. So there'll be 60 different towers we could make. Well, how many different towers in total? All right, well, um, two block towers would be 5b2, 5p2. This is 20. Three block towers, 5p3. We just worked that one out. 60. Four block towers. There's 120 of those we could make. Five block towers. There's 120 of those as well. So adding them all up, there's 320 different towers that we could make. Yes, that was a heck of a lot. We're gonna, you're going to love this, trust me. 